All right, everybody, uh, welcome to uh, Street Life Ministries uh, podcast. We haven't done a podcast in a while, and I'm really excited uh, this morning to be here with uh, Mike Murray, um, our new um, drug and alcohol director for our up and coming uh, recovery program that we're hoping to launch within the next year. And uh, Mike's going to sit with us and share uh, part of his testimony, his journey, and uh, what has, uh, how he's had God lead him uh, to being where he's at right now. Now and, and helping us with this uh, drug and alcohol program. Uh, but before we get started, let's just go ahead and uh, bow our heads and we're just going to give the Lord thanks. Uh, dear God, thank you so much, Lord. Uh, we're doing this podcast on New Year's Day. Lord, thank you so much, God, for uh, giving us another year, Lord. We pray that we uh, get this opportunity to serve you better and we get to uh, have a bigger and deeper relationship with you, Lord. Uh, God, just continue to watch over us, watch over uh, all, all of our vision here with this recovery program, Lord. Uh, bless Mike and his heart um, to be here with us this morning to share about his uh, testimony and his journey journey through through life and drugs and alcohol and and his recovery and his relationship with you lord and just continue to bless him and his wife lord as his wife supports him and comes alongside of him uh through this journey as well and just uh, be with us and um yeah lord just uh i hope this podcast and youtube uh speaks volumes to anybody who watches it and hears it lord and i really truly believe uh you are powerful enough to reach out and grab someone who's lost that will be watching or listening to this and uh bring them back home to you god so we pray these things in jesus name amen, amen. all right so how you doing mike i'm doing well how are you i'm doing good so um where were you born I was born in Grand Forks, North Dakota. North Dakota, awesome. Yes, sir. And how long did you live there for? 18 years. 18 years? Yeah. And what brought you out to California? A long series of unfortunate circumstances. <laughs> okay. My addiction kind of drove me this way. Actually, I sobered up in Seattle for a while. I got back on the needle and ended up here. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, childhood, brothers, sisters, mom, dad, how was is, how is all that? So I was raised by my grandfather. My, my mother died in childbirth. Uh, my biological father was not in the picture. So my, my grandfather and grandmother took me in. My grandmother had cancer. She died when I was uh, two and a half. So it's my grandfather and I. What's it like growing up in North Dakota? Depends on what time of year it is. <laughs> a lot of cold winters? A lot of cold winters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a... <clears throat> For North Dakota, it was a fair-sized town. They called it a city, you know, Grand Forks. It's uh, it seemed a lot more wholesome than, you know, what it really is. Uh, you know, we'd go to the drive-in, we'd go to the roller rink. That was the big thing, the roller rink. Mm -hmm. You know, it was. I mean, as far as childhoods go, you know, place you grew up it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody knew each other in your town. Kind of? uh, north and south and kind of, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, did you start? Did you did you start using in North Dakota, or was it after you left North Dakota? Yeah, no, I believe it was. It was either eighth or ninth grade. Me and two close friends of mine, we always hung around together. Uh, one night, somebody said, "Hey, why don't we see somebody get us wine?" You know, Boone's Boone's Farm. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Mm. <laughs> Bottles of wine, cheap wine. Yeah. And uh, and I think it was eighth grade. And we just got a. We did the shoulder tap thing outside the store. Sure. We just got a bottle of Boone's Farm. Boone's Farm? Yeah. And we, we were going to drink it on the way to the roller rink because we walked. And uh, that night, that first time, I uh, I drank all mine. Jay and Rob, they couldn't uh, finish theirs, and I wanted to finish theirs. So, yeah. like, immediately I knew that I drank differently from my friends. First yeah. time I drank. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so my first my first alcohol was uh, Gallo box wine. Gallo? Yeah, out of the box. Sure. It was it was high class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, only the best. That's out of the box or screw, screw top. That's, oh, yeah. Yeah, screw yeah, top was good. It's where to go. Yeah, I don't have time for a cork. Right. <laughs> it's kind of hard to pull you're that out of your teeth. kind of messy, too, if you're breaking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just kind of walk us through your journey. So you're, you're born and raised by your grandparents and then... 18, and then you start kind of working your way out here. So how, how did all that transpire? When I was 18, I joined the military. Oh, okay. Because I wanted out North Dakota. I just did. Yeah. I wanted to see the world, and uh, I did. 
I did, but once I got in the Army, once I got through training and got stationed overseas, um, you know, guys drank. And there was nothing going on. We just went to work during the day. We'd train in, and, you know, at night, you know, at 5 o'clock we were up, unless we were out in the field. So what do you do? You, you know, you're in Germany, you're going to go and you're going to drink beer. And, you know, beer always leads to something heavier. And then, uh, there was a lot of hash in Germany. Mm. It's weird. You couldn't find marijuana. <laughs> you could find hash. Well, the hash found you. You know, I mean, sure. that kind of progressed. And then uh, I, I tried acid a couple of times, and that was interesting. Um, my drinking led to me being checked out of the service. Mm. All right. So I was not dishonorably, but uh, general under honorable conditions. They called it, you know. It's alcoholism. It's not, you know, it's not too blind, and which is really unfortunate because I, I had become the youngest NCO in our battalion, and then bam, 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 I kept messing up, messing up, messing up, and yeah, there, there was nothing else I could do. I, sure, I get it. It sucks. Mm-hmm. You know, after that, I was really too ashamed to go home. Right, so I didn't go back to North Dakota right away. I eventually did, but first I kind of bummed around the East Coast and the South, just kind of drinking, you know. And uh, I eventually did go home for a short time. Um, thought I'd go to college, you know. By this time, I'm full blown alcoholic, and I, I couldn't handle the studies, you know. I, I wanted to become a cop. I was studying criminal justice with a poli sci minor because this stuff really interests me. Mm-hmm. And instead of becoming a cop, I you know went the other route. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. And the opposite of a cop. <laughs> right. Yes. Because there's only one. There's only one other way to go, right? Well, you know, if you're not, <laughs> you know, I fought the law. The law won. <laughs> you know, now, there was some. I just drank too much. I couldn't do college. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. You know, I always thought I was a smart guy, and I, you know, I mean, not in an arrogant way, you know, just, you're yeah, always hung over, you're not going to do well in class. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what happened there. Sure, yeah. sure. So how did you end up out in California? So you kind of hung out in the East Coast for a little bit, but how did you end up out here? So, eventually, if my addiction grew, but I blew through a relationship, I had two kids and I, I just the drinking was progressing there was some drug use not much um, geographical escape is what what they call it in addiction I'm like I'm going to go somewhere else and things are going to be different you know so I went to Vegas I went to Reno and I, I ended up in Seattle Washington mm-hmm. so I love Seattle it's beautiful I met some people through a church yeah. who uh, they, they, they were feeding once a week, I, I went there because I was homeless. I was homeless in Seattle in the rain one night. I mean, that's how far down I'd gotten, you know? Sure. So I went there for a meal. It was a Thursday night and they had a Bible study. And I got to know these people and um, they took a liking to me. And I actually sobered up through uh, some wonderful people I met at First Presbyterian Church in Seattle. Sure. Uh, Bonnie and uh, Ron and Jace. And they just kind of took me in, mm-hmm. right? I was doing okay. I was working as a mechanic in SeaTac, Washington, because I was a mechanic in the Army. And um, I was living with a friend who was also in recovery. I thought he was in recovery. Long story short, he brought on some heroin one night. And uh, I, I, I shot up. Mm. And these people who put so much trust in me and so much faith in me, I did not want them to see me like that. And I came down here for a funeral. Okay. I just kind of stayed down there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was on the street in San Francisco. Mm. And I, there was a ministry I kept seeing. They were handing out lunches. And I, it was a city team ministry mm-hmm. San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Sixth Street? Yeah. Sixth Street. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Been there myself. I was like, hey, we have a program. And there's a liquor store right across the street. And there's drug dealers on every corner. And I'm like, people still were up here. You know, but, uh, yeah. But, I went in there and I, you know, I had my ups and downs after that. Yeah. You know, I had some relapses, but I wasn't really fully embracing what they had to offer and what Jesus had to offer. But uh, City Team 
Jesus, you said it, you said it to save my life. Amen. Yeah. That's cool. So how long have you been clean and sober? It was seven years in August. Seven years in August. Yeah. Right on. That's awesome. Seven years in October. Pardon me. Uh, seven years in October. Okay. October 9th. October 9th? Right? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. I love that. Yeah, I like you getting your reassurance. Well, I, I'm like <laughs> October 9th, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know. I, I totally agree. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. It's like I've got 16 years. Yeah. But it's like I don't hold on to the everyday thing as much as as much as I did when I first got sober. Now I just, I just kind of, I'm, I'm recovered. You know. Yeah. I, I'm not going back. So it's, it's even though I, I you know, I, it, for statement purposes, when people ask me, I know how long I've been sober, but you the know, days get I'm, fuzzy. Yeah, but I'm more about the I'm more about like the the glory of what God has done now than than yeah. that. But anyway, I just, I just had a birthday two months ago, and I couldn't remember if I was going to be 57 or 58. <laughs> I'd ask, Lord. I would always go for the lower number, <laughs> just if you don't know. At least that's what my wife tells me. If I can't remember her birth date, just go for the lower number. <laughs> Um, oh, honey, how old am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yeah, there's some signs there right now. Yeah. Um, so, so I know, I know, I know. Um, there was a journey through your recovery where you actually, I know, you, you graduated from City Team, and and then you you worked for City Team for a while, right? Yes. So, yeah. how long did you work for City Team for? I was an intern for a year in San Francisco, and I worked for City Team in Oakland for another five years. Another five years. Yeah. Wow. So you've seen a lot of recovery. I have. Yeah. So tell us about that. Just, I mean, because of the fact that not only uh, are we here for people to hear about your your own personal journey, but you are going to become our new alcohol and drug director for our new program through Street Life Ministries. And, um, you know, so, so just kind of walk us through that journey, like some of the stuff that maybe uh, might help some people that have, are going to watch this and listen to this. Just... Um, yeah, I mean, you've seen a lot, obviously. You, you know you know a lot of the characteristics of addiction, so. Well, the character, what, do you want to know about the recovery? Do you want to know the characteristics well, of addiction? Well, just like, um, you know, what? Why, why do you feel like God has, you know, called you? I mean, obviously your testimony is, is huge, but like, how, why do you feel like God has called you to, to not only be a part of City Team for five years, and then now, be a part of Street Life Ministries soon. Well, obviously, as I said, God used that ministry to save my life. Yeah. And because of that, I, you know, I found that I could teach, and I, I, I know that I trust a few people. I got a text last night from a young man who lives in Texas now, uh, uh, telling me, you know, how much I've meant to him in his journey in recovery. Mm. You know, that was touching. Cool. You know? And. Um, I think God's called me to this because it's been given to me and he wants me to give back. Right. I'm, I'm working in mental health right now and, and the difference between working in mental health and working in recovery is in recovery you see a lot more success. You know, in sure. mental health you see people who are sick and they're going to be this way for, well, they're, they're just going to be this way. They sure. hear voices or they're you know, paranoid. You know, in recovery... You know, when I when I talk about recovery with people who are in recovery or trying to trying to get in recovery or trying to stay in recovery, I have to be very upfront about things. And I, this is a life or death thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not just you that it affects. It's we always affect other people in our addiction. You know, and I, I'm very blunt about that and for some reason this seems to get through. You know, I mean there's a bunch of niceties we can talk about and we're in a we're in a culture now that wants to hear a bunch of, of feel good stuff about this isn't your fault and you know I you know after 30 60 days and you know, all the drugs are out of your system if you choose to go back and use again that is your fault mm -hmm. you know and, and sure. I think that people need to hear that perspective yeah because I had someone at city team her name's Trudy she She's kind of blunt, and I, I came up under her, you know, uh, interning and whatnot, and, you know, she laid it out for me, you know, and it's, it's about, I'm a big believer in ownership. You have to own what you've done. Amen. You know, in the, you know, in, in the steps, steps recovery, you know, we do our inventory step four and then step nine, and we're going, we're making amends for 
to people that we've harmed, correct? Mm -hmm. And we, we have to own everything. And if we don't own everything, then we're denying that. And at some point, it's going to come back and bite us. Sure. You know? Totally. I, I can totally relate with that. And I'm very good at relaying that to people. That's okay. something that I've learned. Yeah. And I, I'm not Mr. Feel Good. I'm Mr. This is life or death. Yeah. And this is what works. Sure. Or at least this is what's worked for me. I want to show you how to get there. Very biblical. I mean, I, I, I just, that's all I can say. It's very biblical. There's nothing I've, I've read the Bible cover to cover a couple times, and there's nothing in the Bible where I've ever seen Jesus be codependent. And he's more, he's direct. Yeah. And it's, it's about owning your own responsibilities. Yeah. You know, basically, you know, pick up your mat and sin no more. Exactly. Right? So it's, I, I, was I thinking totally that, get it. I was thinking that same thing this morning when I was shaving. And, uh, yeah, pick up your mat and walk. Right. Exactly. Yep. And don't come back. Yeah. To, don't go back to this, yes. this, this life, but go forward to a new life. Yeah, where it says in Second Corinthians that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become a new creation, not not a half new that dabbles back and forth, but a new creation. And that's and I, I, I love what you just said because that's what this re, our that's what City Team represents, and that's and, and I know when our program that we're going to launch, that's exactly what we're going to represent as well. People yeah. think that once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're in. Right? Yeah. And then everything's going to be cake. Yeah. No, no. That's when the work starts. That's when the work starts. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for for a big part of why my wife and I, we were praying about what's the next step for the ministry. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like right before COVID. And and um, he really put it on both of our hearts that we, we, need, to, we need to excel into a recovery. Because we're watching all of these folks who are living on the street yeah. just, I mean, die from... All this drug overdose, yeah. and um, and I'm and I was I'm just I was baffled by why, for one, and then the other is like you know where where's there I don't see any solutions, and then I start looking at um, you know not to not to bash uh, any any other recovery programs, but at the same time it's just like I'm watching this harm reduction model and this. This just this these spin dry programs that are thirty days, sixty days, and ninety days, yeah. and you basically get somebody who's been living on the streets and addicted for fifteen to twenty years, and you you think that they're going to get recovered in thirty to ninety days, and it's just not going to happen. And then the other is, is there's no faith, there's no there's no mention of Jesus Christ at all, and it's just twelve steps or die, and it's and and um. 12 steps is good. I mean, I, I came up underneath 12 steps. I mean, I had a sponsor that, you know, 90 meetings in 90 days. You know, I worked my 12 steps and he, and he was relentless about making me write every single time. Every time I would call him or meet with him and I had a, a bit of a feeling, next thing I know, I'm writing three pages of my feeling. And it, and it helped me a lot. Yeah. But, I, but I'm telling you, the only thing that helped that process was that I also was taught of serious relationship with Christ. Yeah, before I came to Jesus... Uh... I tried going to meetings and whatnot, and just nothing was clicking. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I found a ministry called Celebrate Recovery, mm -hmm. which is totally Christ-centered recovery. Yeah. Like, wow, things started sure. to click. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess, I, gosh, I, there's so many things I want to jump into. I want to, because I can get off on all sorts of different changes. But, um, so, um, what, what... <laughs> Yes, you know me well. Sure. Um, <laughs> so what? What? It, okay. So with with what we're getting ready to put together and stuff, because I know people are, have got a lot of questions about what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So um, you've been walking through a journey and been praying about it and bouncing the idea of like what our curriculum is going to look like. I know you've been working with Ricky on some of the, the some of the spiritual end, and you guys have been kind of bouncing some ideas. But just, I mean, if you can, just give us a brief overview of what. Because um, I've been asked this question mm -hmm. as coming from from what I th what I think is going to be the first thirty days or sixty days or ninety days in, in the re recovery program, but let's hear from you. Like when 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 we bring somebody that we uh, believe is is a good fit for our program, what are they going to see when they come walking through our front doors the first thirty, sixty, ninety, and on? Well, first I just want to state that we're not reinventing the wheel. Okay. Um, sure. What we're doing is more going back to basics. 
Mm-hmm. You know, the old timers in AA, they would take people through the steps in a few days. Mm-hmm. Literally, take them through in a few days. Yeah. Because people think that <clears throat> people coming into recovery think the hardest part of recovery is staying away from drugs and alcohol. That's the easiest part of recovery. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get guys through the steps, and we're going to start working on their spiritual relationship. We're going to start working on core issues. We're not just going to be looking at well, what did you use, what are your triggers for using, all of that stuff is important. You know, that's very important. We're going to be digging deep into core issues. Not sure. Like People don't realize, oh, why do you drink? Well, I like to drink. Or, or I like to drink and then I couldn't stop drinking. No, why do you drink? Sure. Why do you use drugs? What do you, you know, everybody who gets addicted, <laughs> the majority of them are covering up some trauma from the past. Sure. Right? So we're going to be looking at trauma. And people, people think of trauma as being something like, oh, you know, my whole family died in a tornado. No, trauma is relative. You know, everybody has something. I have something. I'm sure that you have something. We all have some type of trauma. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we're going to have some people, uh, psychologists, who can be able to work with people and say, hey, we're going to find where this started and we're going to confront it. Right. You know, the only way to get through trauma, you can't go around it, you can't go over it, you can't dig under it. you got to go through it. And it's painful. Sure. See, that's when I say the the hardest part is not laying down no common drugs. It's... That's the easiest part. Mm-hmm. Get through trauma. We're going to talk about what their idea of God is. You know, some people really have a negative con- connotation of you know, God the Father because of their earth- earthly father may have hurt them in some way. That's me. Okay. It was me. All right. Yeah. See, you know, people are, you know, if somebody comes to us and says, I want recovery, you know, and they say, but I don't, I don't believe in God. I'm cool with that. You know, we're going to work on that. We're going to work on that. Um, what else? Giving back. Giving back to the community mm-hmm. is going to be just paramount because taking my mind out of myself, my problems, and, and trying to help somebody else has been paramount to my recovery. You know, I mean, if I'm not thinking about my own stuff and I'm just trying to make somebody else feel, feel better, um, a meal, a smile. I was going to say shoveling somebody's sidewalks. So I was thinking about North Dakota. We didn't have to shovel sidewalks. Right? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure we, something out. There. Let's People hope do it that. doesn't come to that. <laughs> <laughs> shoveling sidewalks. Doing for others is, uh, you know, just like AA says, you know, get your mind off yourself, help a newcomer. That's right, right. Help somebody else. Um, yeah. We're essentially going to have the first six months mapped out in day by day calendar type thing. What classes we're going to have? Relapse prevention, uh, spirituality, and something that I call extreme ownership. Yeah. You know, Ricky is going to be taking care. Of, you know, spiritual needs. I'm going to be talking about things that are very, very important to me, and I believe in recovery. It's integrity. Yes. Honesty. Yes. Um, no compromise. Yeah. You know, every great failure has become be, begun with compromise. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, we, we see churches, we see, you, you just told me about Church Walker, we see churches who, uh, there's a little bit of compromise there, there's a little bit of co- compromise there, and then all of a sudden, the gospel's all out of whack in that church, you know? Yeah. Yep. Uh, integrity right. means no compromise. Right, right. You know? Yeah. So we have to... <laughs> Show our men what that means in a biblical sense, sure, and a, a walking it out sense. Yeah, you know, I love that. Yeah, that's good. You know, it's, it's interesting you just said that. My, so both my wife and I are in recovery, and um, we both follow the principle of being rigorously honest. Yeah, and I've noticed in my marriage, it's uh, <laughs> some days it can be the most painful thing, right? Because we're just so brutally honest. But it's also kept us married, yeah. Because we don't hold anything back. Yeah. You know, she tells me what she she tells me what she's feeling. I tell her what I'm feeling, and we hold each other accountable way more than um, 
I ever could imagine. And it, like I said, sometimes I will walk away like a little kid, like she doesn't know me, and no, no, no. But then I realize after when I pray about it, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I go back and apologize. You know, you don't, you don't know me. Yeah, you don't know, you don't know my yes. <laughs> it's your wife. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. I only, I'm only with you like 80, well, 80 to ninety percent of my life. Right? Lori but, knows me better than I know myself. Right, exactly. So she looked at me driving here. She's you're nervous. You're getting nervous. Yeah. So she, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not to be nervous about. But uh, but yeah, it's just. But it's. But it. It's. It's good for for an addict to always be in a position where you are rigorously honest. I've. I, it's helped me not just in my marriage, but it's helped me with other people. And I. And I know that it's. I. You know. I know. It's might be hard to believe, but I have. I have some people there that are that don't like me so much. You know, out there, and, and it's part of it is just just because I'm brutally honest. Brutally honest, and um, you know, and it's it is what it is. I'm not really gonna trip off of it too much, but well, um, I, well, it's not it's not like you have to be rude. I mean, being honest can be seen. You know, being brutally honest can be seen as as being rude. But yes, you know, sometimes you're talking to someone and they want like a brick wall. They're just not getting it. Yeah, and so you just got to ask them why you want to die, boy. You know, yeah. it's. Yeah, for me, it's kind of the, the burning buildings s- 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 um, scenario. Mm-hmm. You know, when I see, if you're walking by a burning building and you see a baby in there and, and the baby's going to die and everybody else is standing around, what would you do? I'd, I, of course, I'd, I'd try to run in there and save the baby's life, yeah. right? Well, if I see somebody living a life that's potentially going to give them, a, a, put them in a spot where if they die, they might not go to heaven. Right, because yeah. they're uh, they're being unmoral or they have no integrity. So I feel like you know, hey, I want to at least be a good brother to you and say something to you and hope that you understand it. Some people aren't ready. Well, you know, some people aren't ready to receive. They're more defensive than they are ready to receive. But anyway, that's a I digress for a minute. But sure. um, so yeah, so like say say we're getting ready to launch this program, mm-hmm. hopefully in a year. Sure. Um, like I said, we're still looking for a building. And all that stuff, um, you know, it, which is in this Bay Area, is just it's challenging. Yeah, very challenging. Everybody wants a lot of money for a building, and um, and I want free, but you know, so I'm trying to find a way to meet somewhere yeah, yeah. in the middle between middle. between yeah. thirty thousand a month and free. Um, so anyway, so anybody that might watch this or listen to this, if you have a a, a, a nice building for free, let me know. But um, so. Uh, uh, when we get ready to start doing the assessment, like what are what are some of the things that you're you're going to be looking for as a as a candidate to come into the program? So honesty, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, because you and I, you and I can talk to an addict, and we can know, you know, we've got a little uh, uh, BS detector, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. You can tell. Yeah. We can tell. A junkie knows a junkie. Yeah. You know. Yes. <laughs> Consistency. I mean, are they willing to engage with us on a, um, say, a tr- twice weekly basis? Just, right. You know, so we can kind of monitor are they trying to stay clean or not? You know. Um, willingness. Uh, kind of the same thing. We have to gauge willingness. I mean, Everybody's willing when they've been living under a bridge for, for, for a long time. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I want to do this. And, you know, what they want is a bed and a roof. Right. You know, I mean, everybody would be saying, yeah, we, we, wow, it's going to be so difficult because there's so many people in need. And it's like, how do you go and pick, the, you know, you know. So this is one of the reasons that I think a smaller program is going to be better is because we're going to have so much one-on-one time with guys. Sure. Okay. We're going to have to have that one-on-one time with, with our candidates, elect better tunes of candidates. Sure, that works. We're going to have to have that because we can get to know them. Mm-hmm. You know, if their story changing, you know, that type of thing. I, I know that sounds kind of terrible. It's like, are oh, you trying to catch me lies? Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. kind of, you know, but, we, we, but that's, that's, that's right though. We have to get to know them. Yeah. 
beforehand. Yeah. You know, it's not just do they check all these boxes, it's you know, be at the home. Yeah. You know, because it's going to be a big transition coming from the street into a, a situation where they're living with people and the, the, uh, there are certain things they have to worry about they didn't worry about before. Like, yeah, yeah someone's got to clean that toilet. You know? So, you know? Yeah. It's, so we're going to be looking at will they be compatible with other people? You know? Yeah. And honestly, what we learn from getting to know folks is it's not going to guarantee it that they're going to fit in with everybody. You know, that's something that's going to have to, right. we're going to, have to work on over time. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's no, a no new drama. situation, a totally new situation for some people. Sure. Right? I know a young man, he's super young, he's younger than me, he was literally on the street for 20 years, him and his dog. Well, you know, and now he's, he's sober and he's working the, in the tenderloin helping other people, you know, but he, coming into recovery, I was there when he came in, I was working at City Team, and uh, everything was new. Everything, having a bed was new. Right. You know, having uh, having regular meals was new. Mm -hmm. And that, he's doing great. But he, yeah. he took a long time to adjust. Sure. Yeah. It's interesting you said that because... Um, one of the things I've learned over the last 14 years of working with the folks on the street, because mm -hmm. they have this, they have this new thing out, which um, I could go into a whole argument on. But anyway, um, it's called they call housing first. Yeah. So what they do is is, is uh, they take the, the the fully addicted addict out of control, and they just put them in put a hotel. Put them in a hotel. We're just gonna, and that's you know, it's an SRO, yeah. And, Pretty much, yeah. and and I and and trust me, I could spend another two hours going down the pitfalls of of, of that model. But um, the thing is, though, is that the one the one re reoccurring theme that I've seen from every single one of those folks that have gone into those hotel rooms or apartments or whatever is that they go from living underneath a freeway where thousands of cars are going over their head every day to an apartment where when you shut the door it's super quiet and it's almost it's so quiet it's deafening loud to them right so the adjustment of going from from that noise to quietness where for you and i right i mean i, I love going inside my house and just enjoying the peace and quiet right yeah but for somebody who's listened to nothing but 18 wheels of a truck or a car going across the, the freeway for so long yeah. it's it's enough to drive them insane right so there's that adjustment that when you go from say homelessness like you're saying this young man for 20 years yeah. into a recovery home where all of a sudden now you have your own dresser drawers mm -hmm. you have your own bed you have blankets you have sheets you, you know you can you have a heater you have a kitchen a refrigerator I mean it's a massive adjustment it is for somebody so it's culture shock oh, oh yeah it's it's and that would be I would say would be the number one reason why somebody would just totally bolt out the front door because it scares them oh it's so it's super scary yeah. right so I I say that because I agree with you I think doing the smaller model where we have five to seven guys living in a, a, a home where you have a house resident manager that's kind of you know overseeing everything that's going on and then more one-on-one -on -one peer counseling to watch the individual like you said you know not so much just to catch them in lies or whatever but we'll be able to tell the like how they're really doing with their with the adjustment right some people will take to it right away and some people are going to have a really tough time you know i mean i i've watched so many different scenarios i mean you know here's here this might sound kind of rude and crude but here's one of the biggest things i've seen people who spent 10 or 15 years on the street they haven't used a, a toilet or used facilities like like that that's their own and i've talked to so many people they spend so much money on Ruder Ruder coming out because all of a sudden they go, hey, I could just put it in here and flush. Yeah. Put it in here and flush. Yeah, not good. And it's not good, but so, but it's like we turkey just, carcass. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, like 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 <laughs> like I've had to tell my kid the garbage disposal is not a it, you don't shove everything down the garbage, but you just but these are things that you don't know. I mean, you just don't you you haven't had to. So it's it's a learning curve. I mean, there's so much to learn. This must sound very foreign to people who are going to see this. I mean. Oh, totally. Yes. Yeah. It, but it's reality. Yeah. When I moved from when I moved from San Francisco down to Cupertino, that quiet 
got me. And uh, it, it was hard. It was sure. Hard. And then one night I was sitting at the table, I was uh, typing a paper or something, and a fire truck came down the street, all right? And I, I, I didn't even look up. And everybody else was like, I'm not sad. What's on fire? What's on fire? And I, I don't see anything, you know? Because that's what I was used yeah. to, is that fire trucks yeah. every five minutes. Yeah. Oh, so I, you know, it's so funny you say that. I just really quick just is uh, I remember when I would get around people from the church. Mm-hmm. When I first got sober and got out of Salvation Army, and, yeah. and uh, I hear people in the church were like standing. If I was going to Menlo Church, and there's a lot of guys, normies, right? And they hear sirens in the background. Oh, there goes a pol- I wonder where those police are going. I go, that's not a police car. <laughs> I go, how do you know? I go, well, you got to know the difference in sirens. <laughs> I got to know the difference. That's, that's a fire truck. <laughs> that's not a, and then they would look at me like, how does this guy know this? I go, you need to know when to duck and run and when, when not to. <laughs> yeah, I used to, I used to, I'm not part of this. I used to enjoy kind of freaking people out now and then. It's like, yeah, I used to see her on my neck, you know? Yeah, I know. So in a small group of church, right? yeah, I used yeah. To. So here, here, so let me tell you, let me let me, let me tell you something that was so funny. So, so I get out of Salvation Army. Salvation Army actually had like a little a little connection with Menlo Church because mm-hmm. you know which I don't know if you know much about Salvation Army, but you go from you go colored dots. So you, go, you start off at a yellow dot, orange dot, green dot, red dot, and red dot is like you're getting ready to graduate. That's so, not too uh, 1930s Germany. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Never really thought about I'm that. I'm sorry, but anyway, so um, so anyway, so I was at, at I was at the color dot where where you could go to a, a church outside church, right? Mm-hmm. So they would they had like three or four vans, and they go to they had these certain churches you can go to or Salvation Army Chapel. So Menlo Church was one of them. So I started going there, and I really enjoyed going there. And then when I graduated, I, I that's the church I, I landed at first. And um, the pastor and his wife, John Ortberg and Nancy Ortberg. I got to know them a little bit and, and they really were fascinated by my testimony and I was just barely getting to know some of the people at Menlo Church and and let's just say my upbringing and my life was a lot different than most 99.9% of the people at Menlo Church, right? <laughs> and so, so so he, so Nancy and John thought it would be great if they sat me down and did a podcast where I just shared my testimony to the oh, church. Lord. So I <laughs> 20, 30 minutes, shared my whole entire testimony and talked about all the stuff I did. And, you know, and I was really new Mm -hmm. in recovery. I had this much recovery and this much past. So my 20, 30 minutes was all about robbing and stealing. And, you know, I mean, it was was crazy. So this thing here. No, it did. Oh, they played it over all the services (laughs) on all the screens. I've never seen so many people clutch their kids or purses after that. (laughs) I'd walk down the hallway. They would see my face coming. People like, you know. So yeah, it did. It was interesting to watch the. It, it's good to go in there and establish dominance. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they, yes. They were too. But I had this one couple that really just they really were not afraid of me, and they took me in, and they became actually uh, uh, JD and Renee Masterson. They became my adopted Christian parents. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what my friends were saying. They were in their 70s and brought me in their house. I walked in their house, and he was a doctor. Yeah, Ron and Bonnie became my church yeah. parents. Yeah. It's amazing. I walked in their living room. I looked down at him. I said, you don't even know me. And he, and, I, and, he goes, and, I go, and he goes, what do you mean? I go, I go, I could rob you. And he goes, really? He goes, what do you want? What do you want? And I went, I go, well, I just took the fun out of it. I said, no, I want to do it while you're asleep, not when you're awake. <laughs> You know, and he goes, now you just offered everything to me. Gosh, that's just no take all the thrill out of it. So, but yeah, they became really good friends. Go check out their neighbor's house. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But anyway, um, but no, I, I really do. I, I appreciate your time coming here and, and doing this. And, and um, I look forward to the next year. I, I'm really excited about 2022. I know we got a building. I know God's put put something together for us. And I and I really, really cannot wait to get, get this program up and running so it's i can't it's, either yeah i'm excited yeah. so just really quick before we end and um and um sign off here what are your thoughts i i why well, i already know your thoughts but what what would you tell people um that will watch this and not understand you know um what's the difference between say like a, a i call them spin dry programs and like what we're going to offer and the difference between programs that really shun off 
the fact that it's a spiritual program versus the program that we're going to launch that's going to be very hyper focused on the relationship with Jesus Christ. So, for a serious alcoholic or addict, a spin dart, spin broad program, so let's call it 28, 30 days, you barely got everything out of your system. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's a, you, that's basically detox for a serious addict. Yeah. Now, when I, seven years ago, when I, when I was coming down, I, I had the DTs for six weeks. You know, I mean, it was terrible. Yeah. You know, a longer term program gives you time to, um, as I said earlier, address core issues. Yeah. Whereas 30 days, even 60 days, you're barely eating sober. You're, you're making connections at meetings, hopefully. And basically, here's a chip, go out. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you again in a few months. I mean, because that's, oh man, that sounds terrible. So there's this detox, and or it wasn't detox, it was, a, it, it was a high end treatment center in St. Louis. I was in St. Louis for a while. Right across the street, there was a bar. And if you went in there with your, your coin from across the street and gave it to them, they'd give you a free drink. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a revolving door. And short-term programs, I'm not saying all of them are like this, short-term programs may as well install a, revol a revolving door at the front yeah. because they're going to be bad. You sure. know, a long-term program, you have time to get real. You know, right. we're giving you time and resources and connections to get real. And in our program, we're gonna make sure they get real. We're gonna make sure they get real because we're gonna have people there in the building who, who know, you know, the, the psychological stuff, the uh, the addiction stuff, sure. the spiritual stuff. We're, we're, we're not gonna, you know, uh, I remember a man, my old ministry, um, he was maybe a month shy of graduation. He came out with this deep, dark issue that he hadn't mentioned up till this point. You know, uh, you know, ten months. So it's like, wow, we haven't dealt with that at all. With that at all, mm -hmm. you know, and that's bad. We're, we we don't have the luxury of time. Sure, a year is not enough time, right? right. Recovery's a lifetime thing. Sure. I mean, I still have a therapist. You know, yeah. I still have a therapist. Sure, because. I messed up. I mean, I'm just messed up, right? Right. right. Uh, I think everybody could benefit from therapy, but um, an addict or an alcoholic, a serious one, definitely. You know, you, you got to get this deep dark stuff out. People talk about the monster under their bed or in their closet. You know, once, once you voice it, <laughs> once you say this is the thing. You know, and it's out. The monkey's off your back. You see, that monster's just a little mouse. Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't have any power anymore. Sure. You know, and that's the same thing with the rigorous honesty. You know, once you voice it, once you say, I did this, mm -hmm. it doesn't have power over you anymore. Right. You don't have to be afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, at the end of 30 days, like I said, I, I had the DTs for six weeks. At the end of 30 days, you're still afraid. You're still afraid. Mm -hmm. You're afraid to drive by the liquor store the bar used to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a real thing. Sure. You know, we give you time to conquer these things. You know, people think that we're fighting alcohol and drugs. We're not. We're fighting a literal demon. We're fighting our demons that we've been sure. carrying around for years. Amen. That's what we're going to focus on in our programs, the core issues. What's your demon? Mm -hmm. You know, I always ask, when, when I'm working with somebody in recovery, what is it? You know, I'm talking sure. to a coworker. Have you seen it yet? And it is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're a rageaholic and they're they're trying hard to keep it in. Maybe it's a gambling thing. Maybe they were abused as a kid, and, and just every now and then they'll they'll say something or see something, and there you see it. Mm -hmm. You know what it is, and you know how to help. Right. You know, with, sure. with a smaller group, we're gonna be able to find out what it is for each guy. Sure. Right? And yeah. we're going to have the resources to attack it. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, I'm excited. Let's, let's just open the doors tomorrow, right? Yeah, let's right. do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I'm so, I'm so sick and tired of just thinking about the vision of this. I wanted to open right now. So, 
Cool, man. Thank you, Mike. Well, I'm, sir. I really appreciate it so much. I, 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 I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm very excited by this. I so. am too. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be a beautiful year. So, um, so anyway, so thank you um, so much, everybody who's watched our podcast and a, and a part of this. Uh, we a couple of things I wanted to share with uh, um, our group that if if any of you who've seen this podcast or watched uh, watch this on YouTube, if you have any issues with addiction or drug or drug and alcohol of any kind and you need support, we'll put our website and our website's phone number on, on this uh, on the screen for you to contact us. Let us know. We'd like to be able to help you out. Even though our program isn't up and running, we have um, great relationships with a lot of programs here in the Bay Area, Oakland, San Jose. Salinas, Monterey area for men and women. So we can definitely get you connected to some good programs. And then the other is, is this vision can't happen without help and support. So first off, we're asking anybody who sees this and watches this, please pray for us because this is going to be a huge endeavor for us. And then the other is, is um, we'll put our website address um, on the screen as well. If you want to help us financially help support, when you donate, just make sure you put on the donation for H to H. So it is being matched. We have a, a family who's come alongside of us and has given us a million dollars so every dollar that we raise is matched to that million and so we're trying to reach our goals of, of, of accomplishing that million to turn it into two million so with that we'll be able to run the program for three years and um, so we just need your help so thank you so much and we look forward to this new this new year in 2022 God bless